The following is a local resident producer's program. The program content is the sole responsibility of the producer and does not necessarily reflect the views or policies of CATV2, Oshkosh Community Access Television, the City of Oshkosh, the Oshkosh Cable Television Advisory Commission, or Time Warner Cable. Hi everyone, welcome to another edition of Ion Oshkosh. I'm Cheryl Hentz along with former Oshkosh Mayor and City Councilwoman Melanie Bleckel. Believe it or not, campaign season is upon us once again, this time for fall races and elections. And um, our guest this evening is Luann Bird. Luann is seeking the Democratic, uh, she's running as a Democrat, she's seeking the seat in the 53rd Assembly District, hoping to unseat Carol Owens. Um, Luann, however, is going to be facing a September primary because she's running as a Democrat. There is another Democratic challenger, Stephen Dito, who is, is running and hoping to seat uh, unseat Carol Owens as well. So there will be a primary before between these two, but uh, you're the guest this evening. You're on the hot seat. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you very thank much you. for being thank here, Luann. It's a pleasure. Um, you know, one of the things um, that we want to talk about is, is why you're running, but just a little bit that I know about you. Uh, you served on the Oshkosh School Board for six years. Um, yes, I did. Uh, I think two of those you were president. President, right. Um, you've also served um, as president of the Oshkosh League of Women Voters, right. and you worked in Madison for the league, did right, you not? Right, right. This past year I took a job as executive director for the league. Okay. So okay. I was half a block from the Capitol on State Street. <laughs> well, that must have been exciting. It was. And you've also worked as an education consultant in your, in your own I business. I still do you some still do? consulting okay. for school boards. Okay. Oddly enough, the governance restructuring we did back when, when Ron Lampy, when I first got on the board, is becoming a model that many districts around the state are adopting. And so every once in a while I'll get a call for, okay. for that kind of thing. Well, uh, you know, obviously I just gave a very brief synopsis. Why don't you tell right. viewers a little <laughs> bit more about who Luann Bird I'm is and why she's that. running for the 53rd Assembly District. I'm happy to do that. Well, just to add a couple of things to what you've already said, prior to my school board, we needed sewer in my neighborhood, so I'd offered to stuff some envelopes and ended up <laughs> getting on the commission <laughs> and spearheading the installation of sewer in our neighborhood. So that was probably the first big project that I took on. Um, prior to that, I was, you know, looking for Mr. Wright and wanted to be married and a mom, and that's what I, what I was. Um, however, when my husband was in a construction in accident, he was paralyzed. And when my kids started school, my daughter was in kindergarten, our oldest child, when he had his accident. And we started running into problems with handicap access immediately. So it took me about four years to figure out that there was a school board and that we had rights. And at that point, I joined the League of Women Voters, approached the school board and asked them to form the Americans with Disabilities Act committee, and then ran for the school board, was elected. And so that's what sort of started my advocacy for people with disabilities. Then also during that time, uh, it, it appeared my husband wasn't going to go back to work, so I was going to be the sole provider for the family. So I did manage to, to work on my education during that time and got an associate degree in quality management from Fox Valley Technical College and then transferred to Alverno College in Milwaukee where I um, got, a, got a Bachelor of Arts degree in Community Leadership and Development, which was a fairly new field at that time, looking at studying communities, neighborhoods, those kinds of issues, which was right, which exactly what I was interested in. So that gives you a little more background. Okay. Uh, the area that the 53rd Assembly District covers, what exactly is, I know Oshkosh is a part of it, uh, town right. of Algoma, town of Mc 
Nipusk, I don't even know how to pronounce <laughs> it, but it's in your <laughs> district, so you can tell us. <laughs> uh, what, what, are, what area does your district cover? Well, I'm in the town of Oshkosh, which is the northern tip of the district. In fact, in 2000, prior to that, I was in, in the um, Terry McCormick's district. So okay. that when they redrew the lines, I looked at the district and realized that now I'm in Carol Owens district and it wraps around Oshkosh, then it wraps around Fond du Lac, all the towns around with the exception of uh, Friendship and El Dorado in the middle there. Um, so it picks up and it catches Amro and it catches Waupon, the cities of Amro and Waupon. It actually has 15 towns. So it's a very rural area. And the interesting thing about the district is I am from Oakfield. I grew up oh, okay. on a farm in Oakfield, and my husband, Phil, is from B the town of Byron. So we really have roots. I'm the only candidate, really, who has roots in the entire district, and then Phil's family is very active in the Fond du Lac area. So. Okay. Wow. So That's I was happy to see them redraw those lines. I thought, well, someday <laughs> maybe I'll run. You know, this is looking yeah. pretty good for me. So. Well, just a couple things right off the bat. Sure. Um, y you're running as a Democrat, um, as is Steve Dito, as I mentioned in the open. So obviously there's going to be a September primary, and you're both trying to unseat Carol Owens. Right. Um, you know, but for the immediate term anyway, obviously you're going to be focusing on each other. Right. Um, what are some of the main differences between you and Mr. Dito? Like, why don't we start well, there? Well, um, I just have a, a little broader base of experience, I would say. I've got education in my background. I've got local government, a lot more of that kind of experience in my background. And I've made a difference in the areas that I've taken on. So it wasn't, it actually wasn't so much I was running against Steve. I was, I really took a look at Carol Owens, I took a look at her record and I just decided we needed a stronger voice in that area. And then I did do a little bit of research on Steve and just really felt that I was a stronger candidate and that's why I threw my hat in the ring. Okay. Well, speaking of Steve, um, now he had sent out a press release um, just the other day, and I'm sure that you, I don't know, did you see it? Yes, I okay. did. Um, it's very short for the benefit of the audience um, who may not be aware of it. Um, I'll just read it. It says, Stephen Dito, Democratic candidate for the 53rd State Assembly District today, um, and this was uh, the 7th of June, responded to the announcement that Lou Ann Bird was entering the race in the 53rd Assembly District by issuing the following statement, quote, it's a free country. A person can run as a candidate for any party they want to. In 2000, Luann Byrd ran as a Republican against Terry McCormick in the 56th District. Perhaps she feels she will have more luck in 2004 running as a Democrat in the 53rd District. I'm sure that my Republican opponents will be delighted by her announcement that a moderate Democrat is now in the contest. And then it goes on to talk about that he's going to remain a Democrat. He's always been a Democrat. I guess, fair question. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. You, you ran back in 2000 right. as a right. Republican, right. and you've already explained how you, you know, are no longer in Terry McCormick's district because of the lines being redrawn, but why the switch from Republican to Democrat? One reason that I joined the Republican Party was because I'm a strong advocate for local control. And the, the really the Republican Party is no longer, in my opinion, an advocate for local control, and the Taxpayer Bill of Rights is the reason. There were also really, I didn't quite fit in that party, and that's how I learned to. There were other issues there that when I walked in that room, I just knew that there, were, there probably wasn't enough of the Republican Party. That, so the minute that I had to drop out of that race and had a time really to reflect on the experience, what I stand for, what they stand for, and frankly, went back really just to advocating for the issues that I felt were important and mainly through the League of Women Voters. So, And that's a fair question. I think a lot and, of people oh, are absolutely. disillusioned with the parties altogether. Absolutely. So. Oh, I can certainly speak to that. <laughs> I've, it, it, because I, I too have run, as you know, Luann. I know, um, I know. And that's, I, I'm looking across the table going, hmm, Remembering. this looks <laughs> vaguely familiar with the exception <laughs> of the school board thing. What? Good for you. Um, when, when you, you go from a person who's genuinely pretty satisfied with your life, things are going along pretty quietly, you're doing the mom thing, you're doing the wife thing, and something comes up in your neighborhood and 
you become activated because that's precisely how I got involved in city politics. They were going to build apartments in our backyard and it was the flood plain, flood fringe, flood way. I swear to God, I'll think of that in my sleep. So you, you go through all of this, you go through the education. I mean, you've been through an awful lot with, mm -hmm. with your husband becoming disabled at a very young age, raising your family, mm -hmm. you know, going back to school. Obviously, this is not how you kind of envisioned your life, the, no. the path, no. you know. Um, so so you, you're going along quite nicely and boom, here it happens and, and you have to kind of change paths. You, you have to kind of be pretty mm -hmm. swift on your feet. Mm -hmm. So you, you get this education and you're doing really well. You're, you're the executive director for the League of Women Voters in Madison. You, you're doing it. You miss home, I'm sure. A little bit, yes. What on God's <laughs> green earth, Luann, you're a smart lady, possesses someone to go <laughs> for the state legislature with you know multi-billion dollar deficits, shared revenues being ripped away, public school funding being a, a, an absolute disaster, cutbacks, manufacturing jobs going right down the flusher. What possesses someone in, in these times? You know, when times are good and, and it's looking pretty good, it, it's not so bad to be a part of something like that, but when things are really bad and you had nothing to do with messing them up, <laughs> why would you weigh in in that muck and mire seeing that you've got the John Guards and people like this who really have not shown a whole lot of interest in getting anything of any significance or any meaning to our community done. What, you know, because I'm trying to understand the thought process. I know what mine was. I just like to hear what yours is, is to. Um, besides being a little bit crazy. <laughs> yeah, okay, um, I, I that, can relate. That aside, <laughs> yeah. you just have to follow your passion. And that's exactly what I'm doing. When I have seen problems in the past, I've not run from them but I've dove in to make a difference and change them. So I, I look back at just that history and working in Madison, the, a very small part of my job really was lobbying for the league, but it was just enough to be at the Capitol, you know, quite a bit from time to time. I could drop in, I could drop off testimony at the hearings, but I really couldn't stay. But it really gave me enough of a feel for what is going on and the problems that are down there. And I just believe strongly enough in our government that I could get in there, I could either watch it from the outside, continue to build the league, or I could get in there and try and make a difference. And that's where I'm coming from. It's like, well, I, I can take on this challenge too. Now, it, I've learned enough that it takes time. It doesn't change overnight. But if I can be a voice for the people from the 53rd, that's where I want to be. I want to be in there making a difference. When, when you have the voice for the 53rd, what are some of the things that you want to go to the Capitol and say? What is missing in the representation that we now have in the 53rd District with Carol Owens? And what are the things that you think need to be said that have not been said or need to be said differently? We need to change the agenda down there. There are issues that are very important to the entire state as well as to my district. A couple, couple of issues that I think are just hot. One, of course, is jobs, creation of jobs. We need to build our, rebuild, continue to build on our economic problems in this state. And that's huge. I think that's one thing we should, where we should be putting our time. Second thing, of course, that's coming up all the time is education. They're going to be tweaking that funding formula, and I'll bet that a lot of legislators don't know how that thing works. Mm -hmm. But having come from the school board, I do know how that works, and I do understand the inequities that are out there. I've also continued to study that as a member of the State League of Women Voters. We always have a State Education Committee. So I've continued to track and follow education. So I can be a strong voice for the people from the 53rd on education. And the third thing that really, really, I think we're underestimating the importance of is health care. We have lots of problems with local budgets. Local businesses have lots of problems affording to, you know, trying to find the money to just pay their employees. and. And I, th and I really believe that healthcare continues to erode the cost of healthcare. It's unaffordable. We have more people today that are out of, that don't have coverage. I personally, and uh, my family really, my husband's uninsurable, and he's a, vet a Vietnam veteran, so fortunately we have the VA to fall back on. We'd be in big trouble without that. So I understand the importance. 
I understand the costs. I mean, I finally had to give in and, and give up any choice in healthcare and join one of those networks in order to yeah. afford it. Mm -hmm. I think that we are underestimating that. And the, the, uh, the other reason I decided to run is I, I got to know that there's the capital and there's the network around it. And I mean, there's, there is big administration down there, but there's also a whole group of nonprofits that are working toward issues that have some solutions to these problems that we can tap into. For example, I, I um, met people from the Wisconsin Citizen Action Group, and they have a huge, they have a huge network throughout the state, but they also have a health care, a state health care plan on the books that we should be taking a look at. One that could take the money and redistribute it so that everybody has coverage and we're not paying 25 cents on every dollar to keep people out of the system. Mm -hmm. So there's plans out there. There's also campaign finance reform, a big need to take a look at. Elect affordability in the election process, a good, a good uh, we need to keep looking at tracking the money and understanding who's funding what down there. And there's the Wisconsin Democracy Campaign that already is working on this issue. They just need more people on the inside carrying the flag. So I would want to work with Mike Ellis on that. I know the leadership in the Senate that fell apart last year because of the bipartisan fights that come up. But I want to get back in there and say, no, come on, we can work together on the issues that are important to the people of Wisconsin. And that we keep talking about, not all this peripheral stuff like gay marriage mm -hmm, and, right. you know, should we be packing heat at the hospital, you know, the concealed weapons laws, those kinds right. of things. That I mean, we're getting so bogged down with these things and mm -hmm. we have really serious issues mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. seem to be getting, and, and every year, every session, we hear the same thing over and mm -hmm. over. Well, we got it this far, but we couldn't get it all the way. So we'll bring that up again next session. That's it's kind right. of like a built-in excuse mm -hmm. on why these people should keep mm -hmm. getting reelected because I still have so much that needs to be accomplished. Well, yeah, because you guys never do anything. You sit and bicker and fight and nothing's getting accomplished. Mm -hmm. And with that comment being made, the disenchantment with the two major political parties, Republicans and Democrats, you're seeing more and more people, or at least hearing more and more people talking about, I'm not really a Republican, I'm not really a Democrat, I feel like I'm an independent. I don't like either one of these parties because they're not getting anything done and, and they're more interested in making sure you know, their own personal agendas or, you know, their terms are repeated. <coughs> so what made you decide to choose to be a Democrat? Uh, are, are you considered more liberal or are you moderate, as Steve Dito has said? Are you more conservative? When you say Democrat now, nobody really knows what that means because we're seeing the two parties come so close to being almost the exact same mirror it's image of one another. almost blending in many yeah, cases. They're, they're like a mirror image of one another. You don't really see that, that big difference between the parties anymore. Um, and I, So when you say Democrat and you say Republican, I don't know that people are really understanding what that means. Well, I'm having a hard time getting an answer from my Republican friends that are, are uh, when I ask them what is happening to the party, why is it no longer advocating for local control? And I'm not hearing even a lot of Republicans that are supporting that agenda. Probably the bigger question is who is controlling the agenda? Mm -hmm. And why can't people like even Carol Ressler or Greg Onderheim get, get a, a better handle on that agenda so that issues that they even advocate for that's They've what been I'm there hearing. Long right. enough. They're that's not what I'm even hearing. in leadership mm -hmm. positions mm -hmm. for all the time that mm -hmm. they've spent. You know, Greg Underheim has been in office a long time. Mm -hmm. Carol Rossler has been in office a long time. Carol Owens has been in a pretty good mm -hmm. number of years. Mm -hmm. They're not in leadership <laughs> positions that right. would be taking control of major issues. And my question would be you keep coming back home telling us that you are these wonderful leaders and we should be so grateful for all the things that you've accomplished because in the newsletter that we get in the paper, it's a photo op session, but I'm, I don't see them in true leadership positions. Is that because we're lazy? Is it because we're, we here in the district aren't demanding more answers. Are we not asking the right questions? Are we not demanding the right answers? What? Well, I'm giving you a chance. I'm giving the people of the 53rd a chance right now to debate the issues by running as a Democrat, which is where I more line up. I want to work more on, on jobs. I want to work more on issues that are important to the people, education, those kinds of issues. 
So I'm giving the people a chance. I do think that, that we have to take a look at what is happening in Madison, and it is hard to understand who's controlling that agenda, but that's what I want to do, and I am getting bipartisan support, which makes me feel good. It means I can go down to Madison with that bipartisan support from my district and say, let's get back to working on the issues. Yes, there's a Democratic platform, and yes, I believe in, in, in the majority of that platform, but I also believe that there's a bigger picture here and, there, and that that's, that's what we need to take a look at. Well, you had mentioned earlier, Luann, that you know we've lost a lot of manufacturing jobs, and mm -hmm. that's no secret to anyone mm -hmm. at this table or anyone sitting at home watching us. Um, do you have some ideas for bringing back some of those manufacturing jobs, or if they can't be brought back, creating new ones? Do you have some thoughts in that area? There are plans out there. In fact, I did connect with John Casper to find out what exactly is the chamber looking at, what are their proposals. I haven't had a chance to read all of those, but again, it's a matter of connecting with the network to find out. As an um, executive director for the league, I had a chance, I was invited to a, a summit with the Wisconsin Public Television to look at globalization, and it was the most interesting discussion. They brought in the union, the head of the, the um, AFL-CIO, and they brought in someone from manufacturing, and these gentlemen had a great conversation about how, you know, the union, of course, says you have to be careful and protect our workers, which is absolutely true but manufacturing commerce is saying, but we also have to look at being able to change, to meet new, to find new markets when markets change. Now there is a plan, there's an economic summit that they hold every year that um, some people in the community are telling me, take a look at these plans, how can, what can we do by in public policy to support that kind of change? So those were some resources that I'd like to tap into in trying okay. to find solutions. The other issue that I'm already tapped into is Barbara Lawton, when she, became elected go lieutenant governor has taken on women, a Women Equals Prosperity project. Um, now I had met some homeless women in Madison that, I mean, I've, I know we have homeless people in this community, but I guess I've not spent enough time downtown to really meet them and get to know them. Well, on State Street, I got to know two homeless women and it really did change my life because I'm not used to that. And, and I got to be friends, particularly with one of them, and I'd hear about her journey day to day we'd have lunch every once in a while and it was just a, it was just heartbreaking for me to see that we you know so i took these women to her barbara's um, forum so that these women could talk about the very bottom <laughs> we're you know they're on the streets we aren't just talking about raising the, the glass ceiling here and it can happen we're very easily right the other women it's not like you're born into homelessness no it, it could happen to any one of us at this table God absolutely forbid. And it doesn't take a heck of a no. lot to, to get you there. There's a lot. So, um, Barbara, I got invited to be as executive director of the league on her uh, task force to look at how we could regionalize this issue. And since the league has a network around the state, we could probably help with some of these issues on raising the economic status of women. It's another opportunity on building our, our economy right now that we can, that I personally can tap into because I'm on her task force and I'm attending those meetings already. So I'm, I'm pretty excited about that. You know, we had the W-2 change, which was positive. It got women off the welfare rules and actually, you know, women do need to know that they can have their place in society and we can function and be professionals. But we may, this initiative makes me think about the working poor out there now. And so what can we do? This mm -hmm. fall, Barbara, they've uh, held a series of forums around the state, and now they'll be coming out with a, a, a series of best practices. Some things are quick fixes, things that businesses can just jump into. Some things will take maybe some public policy changes, but I'm looking forward to that report. I'm hearing, for example, flexibility for women is very important in the workplace so that you mm -hmm. can balance those needs of, of children and family and and work. So what can, we, you know, it isn't always a nine, doesn't have to be a nine to five anymore. Right. Maybe we need to really look at changing how we, how we manage the workplace so that we can support women. And, and, and it isn't always women too. I realize men, it, there's, exactly. been a, right. there's been a real reversal in my house, let me tell you. Uh, well, <laughs> well, it, one of the things that goes along with women and prosperity and, and Barbara Lawton's discussion, um, one of her statistics was that the state of Wisconsin has some of the highest percentages of women in the workforce. We do. Now, what I find interesting is when we talk about pay parity in the state of Wisconsin, everybody goes, la, 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 as though that has absolutely no bearing. We can go out there and we can work, 
but when it comes to pay mm -hmm. parity, everybody gets a little skittish because, you know, how do we determine pay parity? Are we going based on seniority because, you know, the guy <coughs> was hired mm -hmm. 20 years before and she was just hired a year ago? Mm -hmm. and, and that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about women doing the same job at the same time all things being equal, our pay should be equal. Right, and that's still happening out there. It's we're horrible. Not, we're not always getting paid the same. That's really one issue that we need to continue to work on and raise. So, and women are penalized for not for maybe taking time off to raise their children. That's another issue that we need to take a look at. And the thir another issue that I, I hadn't thought a lot about, but it's some of the professions that women tend to work in are not paid very well. Mm -hmm. I talked to a woman who works at Head Start, has her bachelor's degree in whatever, you know, child care, whatever it is, and is making $19,000 a year after mm -hmm. working there for years and took, took zero raise this year just to keep the Head Start program in place. No. Because we're not putting That's a premium right. on raising our children, right. and we wonder why we have the societal problems that we do. We're f the women are being forced to go out to work because it takes two incomes to make a go of it. Mm -hmm. there, this isn't women aren't working because gee whiz, we just really want to. I mean, personally, I'd like to be independently wealthy and forget about the whole <laughs> works. But you know, again, the road doesn't always go that way. But there are women who choose a career, and that's mm -hmm. fine, but w there are many women that if they had to choose between staying home and raising your babies and going out to work, the choice would be pretty clear. You'd, you'd stay home and raise your children. Mm -hmm. you, you've wanted them. You love them. You want, you want to be the one we with them. We need to value that, too. And, mm -hmm. But instead, the difficult choice is, do I put food on the table? provide insurance mm -hmm. for this baby, mm -hmm. and then therefore I have to make this horrible choice by leaving this child mm -hmm. with someone other than myself. Mm -hmm. And child care is a premium. There's not enough of it. There's not enough quality child care. And then you're penalized on top of that. That's right. So there, there's a lot of issues that, that need to be considered. Um, the, night, the good news is we have someone in a place of power right now in our state that's raising the issue, that can actually pull together the network to make something like that happen. So it's I'm good excited. News. I mean, you're talking incremental steps here to create change for women, and that's exactly what, what we're working on, and I'm excited about well, that. Well, you know, we've got the vote, and now God knows we might even actually get pay parity. And what if we ever have an equal <laughs> representation in the legislature, where right now we only have 25%? Holy you cow. You got me started. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I'm going to jump in now. <laughs> Um, well, one of the yeah, ideas yeah. That, that Steve Dito has for um, generating some revenue, and uh, I, I don't know if it would create any jobs or not, but it would definitely raise some, some additional tax revenue, is, is to repeal the tax exemptions for service-oriented type businesses. Mm -hmm. How does Lou Ann Bird feel about that Well, that's, that's been proposed. I would be willing to take a look at that, too. I think we, um, on the revenue side, on the income side of things, that would certainly be worth looking at. They're also talking about raising the sales tax by one, one or two percent, possibly to trade off um, your high cost property taxes for education. I think all of these initiatives do need to be studied and looked at. Clearly, we have to make some changes and we have to prioritize mm -hmm. what's important in our society. So if it's going to take repealing some of these tax exemptions in order to create more opportunities for jobs, well, that's what we're going to have to do then. I always want to do that, though, in the context of having good data in making these decisions, mm -hmm. in knowing exactly as a legislator, this is the research we've done to know that this is the market that we think that that will affect. And these people over here are willing to pay the price or, you know, they might come along grudgingly. But we, I think when we create legislation, that legislators need to be much more accountable with what we're doing and why. Yeah. What, what about um, another of, and I bring up Steve Dito only because, he, you know, he is running for the same seat you're running no for, um, and he has presented some, some interesting ideas that I think are worthy of discussion. Mm -hmm. Another one of his ideas was to offer consumers an immediate 5% discount on Wisconsin-made products. Now, how do you feel about something like that? I would have to look closer at that. I don't know what his theory is behind that. I don't know how that benefits people. I think. Well, I, I think need when to know he was here, more. it was it was to 
generate more business for Wisconsin businesses and then as a result of that creating more jobs getting people to buy more Wisconsin made products rather than products made overseas or in another state basically you know buy Wisconsin just like the buy American promotion that went on for yeah, another year. I don't years. know. I honestly so. don't want to make uh, uh, take a position on that. I'd have to really do a little more research on that, okay. on how that uh, how right. that affects our neighboring states. What is the kind of trade balance that happens in Wisconsin? I really don't know. Sure. Um, Carol Owens, the current uh, representative, um, has not seemed to show much cooperation in, in working with local governments. And, um, you know, you mentioned uh, earlier that there are 15 townships, not to mention the cities yes. that are included, yes. uh, part of Oshkosh being one. Um, she's not shown a whole lot of cooperation in working with these local governments, and yet she has no trouble um, you know, ripping their shared revenues away or voting to help rip those shared revenues away. Um, she does not maintain contact, evidently, with, with local lawmakers to find what issues they're up against. Um, you know, if you were elected, would you maintain some kind of contact with local representatives? Would you come to town board meetings, city council meetings? Would you be somewhat, um, I don't want to say participatory in their budget hearings, because you couldn't be, but would you at least attend their budget hearings, just as many as you could, because I realize, you know, you'd be running all pounds. over the place, I and, know. you know, but, I know. but would you, I guess my question, Luann, is would you make a concerted effort to be as involved and in touch with your local constituency as you can to see what those local governments are up against? There's two things that I did for the League of Women Voters that are, are tools that I need to use as a legislator. One of them was that communication piece. I had started a, communic a weekly communication. Well, I was the, the state, the local president here of Oshkosh, and then took a job at the state league office and realized there was a huge gap. So I immediately started to work on that communication, and it was, it was great. I started sending out these weekly uh, email updates, and people started understanding what the state league office does. Not only that, I could tell them some inspirational story and remind them of what our mission is and what we're here to do and and uh, membership was up this year right over four percent when nationally it went down not only that I found out they were printing these little updates in their newsletters and sending them out to people in fact I met a legislator at a, an event and I someone introduced me and she said oh I've read your, <laughs> your <laughs> weekly updates <laughs> but it was it was exactly what I will do for the people in the 53rd is use my email I'm using it in the campaign already just weekly letting them know what's going on and where we're at because there's exciting things that happen on the campaign trail and having coming from that league background of understanding our democracy and how important how important it is to have informed educated citizens this is an, this is an exciting and it's a natural thing to me to do and I'll do it for the people in the 53rd accountability is is so important and I think communication is one way to continue to be accountable mm -hmm. one thing that I, the other thing that I did for my league I worked with a legislative committee and we had several bills that we were, were working on throughout the year. Well, at the end of the session, I went through and checked them all and you know, which ones passed, which ones didn't and gave them a scorecard. And I said to these ladies, of which the average age is probably 65, <laughs> I said, what do you, well, what do you guys think? You know, and they, I said, how do you like the scorecard? And they said, we've never gotten this before. But hmm. it's exactly what the people in our district need to know. How many bills did I introduce? How many passed? How many didn't? And that that's what I'd want to know about myself for the standards I set for myself. And then I also tracked activity so that they knew how many calls I had made or how many letters we had sent and how many responses we got. Mm -hmm, sure. So there, that's just a natural part of who I am and how I like to work. And it'll work well for the people in the 53rd. All right. They will know what's going on. You know, we said earlier, and you said that, you know, uh, you're not going after Steve Dito. You're going after Carol Dito. Owens' seat. Mm -hmm. And not that I'm asking you to bash Carol Owens, um, but what is it about Carol Owens and her representation that you take issue with? Two things. I did, I did not feel, I saw her on TV a couple of, uh, six, eight weeks ago, and when I saw her, I didn't feel that she was representing the issues very well. I was very disappointed in her, how she was articulating what was going on, mm -hmm. and I feel that's important as a legislator that I that I tell you both sides and why I feel the way that I do so I was disappointed in that and then the second thing is I took a look at her record 
and of all the bills that she introduced, not a one passed. So we don't have a voice for the people. And even if she comes up with a good idea, she isn't able to get it through. In her newsletter, it said, you know, it, even on that show, she said it got too late and we just ran out of time. Well, you know, you know the bird, what the session is. <laughs> the bird she's squeaks. She's been at it long you enough. Know, she's been I, at it 12 I, years. I just feel that that's right, that we need a voice, someone that can get something done. So it, it, Carol's a nice lady, and, yes. and people like her. That's not the issue. The issue is that in these tough times, we need a strong voice. We need someone who can make something happen and make a difference in Madison. I've got a strong record of, being, of doing that, so I'm confident that when I get down there, and it is helpful having worked down there all year, at least I know the people on both sides of the aisle. I actually worked on Carol Ressler's campaign years ago, so you know, Carol's a friend of mine, and they know that I'm not, um, not gonna be out to bash or, you know, just let's work together on these issues. And of course, we'll probably differ on what the agenda should be, but I'm willing to jump in there and try. Luann, one of the things that you got knocked for when you were on the school board was CQI. Oh, yes. Um, the <laughs> other Let's thing. Explain what that is. Um, <laughs> See, I'm putting you on the hot spot. I got to hear it's this. Like, <laughs> it's like quality assurance. Um, yeah. Quality How control. Continuous something? quality, quality uh, improvement. Okay. improvement or right. education, depending right. on. I, the I, one who was all for it's the only one who can say yeah. what it is. Well, that's because, it can, you know, th those, I just <laughs> hate those little acronyms. But th that was one of the things that you got knocked for. And when you were talking about some of the things that you're looking at and looking at studies um, with Barbara Lawton and seeing how some of the outcomes of these studies mm -hmm. were going to flow, that was one of the other knocks that the school board in general took, and you being the president at the time and, and kind of the lead there, took a knock, that we studied things at nauseum. We studied and studied and studied, but never really got off the dime. And when we did get off the dime, it was kind of an expensive dime because these things became, they got so blown out of proportion and we had so many committees and so many subcommittees made up of so many different people <coughs> to decide things that were going to happen in the school district that it got a little carried away. Is there validity to that concern? Did you share, I mean, did you hear that from other people? Was that strictly an Oshkosh Northwestern gripe? Was, and do you think that that could potentially be a problem at the state legislative level? I never could understand why advoca advocating for quality in education was a problem. <laughs> but it, it really broke down to um, process and it was, really a shift as an elected official to start delegating some of the decisions down to lower levels. That really, over to, you know, looking back and, and reflecting on what worked and what didn't, there, there definitely were some downsides to what we tried. And definitely some of the committees got too big and sometimes it took too long. And those were valid criticisms. I think the stronger criticism, looking back, was what are we getting for this investment? Mm -hmm. And I don't think we were clear enough I had a vision for how that could work. I could see it in the classroom, and it's still in process. I will still say that children can take responsibility in the classroom for their learning, and it can work very well. Um, but when it came to the bigger systemic kinds of issues, it was it was harder to say, what are we getting for this investment? There's no tangibles associated with the financials. Well, we don't have agreement necessarily on how to measure effective education. We have test scores, that is one measure, and I'll never forget when we jumped up 9% on our third grade reading test scores when the state was only jumping about, they, everybody jumped, but it was twice what the state did. So I could find some indicators that I felt were, were worth investing in, but it needed to be evaluated, and that's what the public's questioning of that was good. And it, and it did make us really step back and think about it. But we had a lot of business support for doing that. We really, the business community was saying, you know, you need to look at strategic planning. And those components of that, what we started back then, are still in place. They're getting better at it. Now they're, they're having data retreats, which is what the public wants to know. What are we getting for our money? So I think the school district is getting better at, at monitoring and measuring those kinds of pieces. And they're still working on strategic planning. And, and trying to make sure that, that the board holds the system accountable for what they say they're going to do. So there were pieces of, of what you might call CQI that really 
we needed to hone in on and, and, and pieces of it that we should have learned from and moved on. <laughs> with, really. with education being a huge part of your background because you have spent so much time within the school system and being a student yourself, um, one of the things that we talk about a lot, or certainly legislators are talking about and manufacturing is talking about, is the disparity between quality and competent workers qualified to do the next generation's work. Mm -hmm. um, we have been told over and over again that we are going to be doing away with manufacturing jobs and we are going to be moving into a new era. Mm -hmm. My question is, what exactly is the new era? Because nobody seems to know exactly what that is. We are you know, outsourcing jobs. Um, the jobs that we're bringing in to replace them are service sector jobs, which are mm -hmm. historically low paying, no benefits, and don't have that trickle effect that mm -hmm. manufacturing <coughs> jobs had. Mm -hmm. For every manufacturing jobs, it created three service jobs. So you eliminate the manufacturing jobs and you only replace them with service or retail jobs. The trickle effect kind of peters out at some point. So if we are preparing for the new era, first, what is the new era? What, what can Wisconsin look forward to as far as what are we going to hang our hat on? because I don't think it's going to be cheese. Um, and what are we doing in education to prepare the next generation to be qualified workers and, and competent workers and well-educated workers to be able to support the system in the new era? First, I want to say that you've hit the nail on the head for where we need to concentrate in order to prepare our workers on our education system. It is very, very important to the future of our state and to the future of our country. Continuing to work on education and improve and tweak it and make sure that students are prepared, not only when they come out of high school to go into the colleges, but I'm also going to be responsible for those colleges too. Right. And the technical systems and the, um, and, the, and the universities. And it's heartbreaking for me to see where we're cutting, where we're carving out the one area that may be what's needed the most. I want my children, when they graduate, and my daughter's a, f uh, a freshman up at Lawrence this year, well now she'll be a sophomore, I want her to be able to get a job in Wisconsin when she graduates. And I want her to be prepared for that job. So I would take a look again. I always felt that on the school board, we needed to, and gosh, gosh I'm proud of, put this in, started this when I was on the board and put this in place, a graduate profile that says when they graduate, how are our students doing when they leave the system? And that's the kind of data that you take back and you tweak your system with. So definitely, I've spent a lot of time in education. I've spent a lot of time in a very unique college that doesn't have grades, but expects everybody to achieve. I think one of the saddest things we do to kids is pass them on when they haven't learned. Now that becomes a huge social discussion about, oh, but socially they're not ready. Well, you know, but I, you guys, I was the one that sat there in the expulsion hearings and looked at all those report cards of all those kids and 90% of them started failing in elementary. They all come in and they're doing pretty good those first couple years, but then they start failing and they, you see the trend. Maybe they get a few C's and D's in elementary and by the time they get to middle school, you're talking D's and F's and now by the time they get, how can you expect that student who comes in now, you're telling me that there's something in C's, D's and F's that they didn't have to learn and they can move on to the next level? I mean that. That whole thing, we need to have, we need to continue to look at that model and mm -hmm. say, does that really work? That's where some of the standards that are coming into play are helping, helping teachers to look at that, making sure that students are prepared, making sure that the, that the curriculum, it's seamless. And uh, then the next thing that I would continue to advocate for is the requirement that students learn before they, they move on. Now that's well, a huge yeah. shift, you guys. You so. know, talking <laughs> about kids, um, and I realize this is, you know, it, it hasn't gotten too far down in Madison, and there are several different components to it, but how do you feel about, well, first of all, do you know much about Governor Doyle's Kids First Initiative? No, I don't. Okay. I don't. And I won't ask how you feel about it. No, a whole lot, but <laughs> I do like the idea of looking at our kids in Wisconsin, and our what is happening to our children? I, you know, I found out there were 1,300 homeless children in Madison. 
I asked a school board member, how many of your students are homeless? I mean, that's, we do need to take a look at what's happening to those kids. That's absolutely sinful in the United mm -hmm. States, that mm -hmm. we would, that we can walk right. the streets and see fellow Wisconsinites without mm -hmm. anything, shelter, food, health care. Well, and we're busy worrying about concealed weapons laws and whether or not somebody should be able to talk on a cell phone in a moving vehicle. <laughs> I want to go back just for a moment, if I could, because sure. I want to clarify something uh, briefly, if I can, and maybe I didn't make myself clear, but when we're talking about education, mm -hmm. I understand what you're saying about making sure that the whole process is seamless, but when you start bringing together education and business, right? What is it that the business community is telling you as a new candidate that they need in order to bring whatever it is that they're going to bring into the state of Wisconsin? We've historically had manufacturing, lumber, paper. That's going away. What is it that they're saying that they're going to bring in? Because I'm presuming that they have an idea that they haven't quite shared with all of us. And, how d and if they don't know, how in God's green earth are the teachers and the school systems and everybody supposed to prepare if the business sector doesn't know what they want? Mm. Well, good question. The one area that I've heard we could be bringing businesses into Wisconsin in is the technological mm -hmm. fields, the technology fields. So what are we doing to support those kinds of businesses and mm -hmm. get them into Wisconsin? And that's definitely worth looking at. And then looking at are our students prepared for those systems, I know in Oshkosh we had, um, I think, a graphic arts program come in, and the company actually came in and helped invest in the equipment because they knew that they needed students with technical abilities to come right out of our high schools, and they'd hire them, and then they could go right into the technical college, actually get a technical degree, and they had jobs. So you're right. We need to listen to the business community. We need to look around at the state and find out what we can do to bring in those new jobs in the in the markets that are that are, you know, changing. The internet is changing things. We have to stay on top of this. What is, where can you buy things now, you know? And mm -hmm. how can we, again, protect Wisconsin? I also think we need to market ourselves. We are a great state. If we can get beyond all the indictments and things happening in Madison, <laughs> and it is both parties, it is not just one, but it really look, makes our state look bad. Mm -hmm. We need to clean up, clean up those campaign processes and make sure that people trust us again in Madison and, and again, get back to talking about what makes our state so great because we do have i choose to live here i want my children to come back and live here we have wonderful seasons we have wonderful recreation things in this state and we do have a great education system we need to continue to improve areas particularly like milwaukee where we do have schools that still have a dropout rate of 70 percent you know again we need to one size doesn't always fit all that's one thing that i will look at in in creating public policy i represent rural districts and they are going they're having a hard time under the current formulas mm -hmm. paying for their schools. So we need to look at these models, look at this public policy and make sure that we're, we're tweaking it so that it isn't just one size fits all. But I think marketing and talking great about our state is important too. You'd, you'd mentioned, Luann, rebuilding that trust. How do we go about doing that when people are, are becoming so frustrated with elected officials I, for one thing i mean look at all the I people know. who are entering the race when was the last time that this many people went off on carol owens for example mm -hmm. um you know and, and we're seeing it in a number of different races mm -hmm. people are very disenchanted with their current elected officials and that that says that not only are they not happy with what they're doing but i think that there's a great number of people out there who simply don't trust mm -hmm. what the elected officials are doing mm -hmm. how can we short of putting new people into office how can we rebuild that trust what i'm having fun with on the campaign trail is reminding people that it is your government and you can change it you just tend to forget that it, we tend to think of it as a us versus them i don't use rhetoric on my campaign. I don't say government's gotten too big. That's just not evidence for me. I say it's our government. We've created what we've got by who we've elected and let's just get in there and change it. Sometimes we just have to re be reminded that it's our government, that it's government for the people, by the people. We're, it's a representative form of government. 
And it's great. It's, we've got problems. We need to change the behavior and the tone of what's happening down there. But it's still our government. And you, both of you could run, and I hope you do. Have. Melanie, <laughs> run again. No, and I Cheryl, don't know that my you know, hair will we hold more, up. <laughs> well, we need more voices in the process. <laughs> we, we need some more voices on the city council, some, some more we voices do. of the people, that's for sure. We do. I, I never rule out something like that. You but running know. for state office, no, 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 no. I I'll leave that to folks like you. No problem. How do you feel about the Taxpayer R Bill of Rights? You mentioned it before. I'm glad you brought that up. <laughs> How do you feel about that? <laughs> well, that was another one of those things that pushed me over into running because having been a, a school board president under the caps, I know how those work. I know how that can control spending, and I know how it does force you to look at where you're going to prioritize, and that's not all bad. Mm -hmm. But expanding that to all local forms of government government i just think is an extremely bad idea and every town board that i have talked to that knows about it does not like that idea they feel that they can and i'm telling them i'm making them three promises number one that i first of all i trust you i trust local governments that they really can talk to their people and do something about their budgets and you know i'm speaking for town governments towns have typically been very frugal the towns that I've visited, I mean, their buildings are pretty, there's not air conditioning in them. I mean, they're, they're run pretty tight. They run tight budgets in the towns. Mm -hmm. um, SEC, that's my first problem. I trust you, and I know that they can prioritize what the people in their towns want. And I do believe that. And the third thing I'm promising them is that I will take responsibility for the state's portion of the budget. Um, again, the thinking and the things I learned at the State League office where I was the State League, we had a National League, and we had local leagues. And, you know, even longtime leaguers will tell you it's run just like the government. Well, what I had to do in order to be an effective leader for them is I even drew a little Venn diagram to say, okay, now what pieces really does the state do and what pieces does, does national do and what does the locals do? And, you know, over time sorted that out so that, you know, at the state, we don't register voters at the state. Off. That's sure. something local leagues do. But there was a huge part in the middle that we share. And I, I feel that people are confused right now. And, and the Taxpayer Bill of Rights is confusing that because there's a portion that local people need to take charge of. And there's a portion that the state needs to take charge of. And it's my responsibility to tell you what that portion is and how that works. Now, not everyone cares about that level of detail. But the ones that do, I'm, I'm happy to, to, the Wisconsin Taxpayer Alliance put out a great publication a few months ago that really laid it out very well. And, and a large portion of the state does come back through shared revenue or through education, a large portion of that general revenue. But there's another whole portion that people want to know we're controlling and that we're cutting back at the state level. And that's the part that I'm promising local governments that, that I will take responsibility for that. And then I'll let you know what we got done and what we didn't in the areas mm -hmm. that we needed to cut back on. Because if we're in tight times, you know. Well, and it's not only putting controls on the local governments. It's, it's putting controls, basically, on spending on, on the people down in Madison. Well, if, if they want us to basically tell them, yes, you can spend this, or no, you can't spend this, what do we what need them for? Exactly. What the hell do we need them for? We might we as well do it ourselves. We could legislate right from our local. Government by referendum and just Absolutely. be, you know, well, this is a bad idea. You, you raised a good point there from a constitutional side. We have a representative form of government right now. When I was on the school board and we had to pass referendums, those really were great in terms of getting out and talking to the people and making sure that they knew what we were doing. It took an inordinate amount of time and extra taxpayer dollars to do that. Now, you are moving from a representative form of government to a direct form of government. And that is a philosophical change that I disagree with, that I do not believe is best for our state. The other issue is constitutional amendment. There have been unintended consequences to the QEO and the caps that they put on education. And then they could pass a bill, the next legislature, and do something about it. If this bill gets passed, as a constitutional amendment, it will take three years to change any kind of an unintended consequence. And that's the biggest argument we really have against this legislation, is that constitutional piece. It's a bad idea. Speaking of QEO, been on the school board, now you're going to move to the legislature. What are your positions on QEO? Because you've done budgets, you've done mm -hmm. union negotiations, mm -hmm. it's not an easy thing. And QEO is a huge 
do I have time for this question? Because it, it seems like every candidate that we have, <laughs> I ask that you know sixty-four thousand dollar question, and you got thirty seconds we'll to answer. We'll ask the question short, okay. and then we'll have time. <laughs> what is your position on QEO? The QEO, the cap, and the two-thirds funding all went together. I really am having a problem that they took away the two-thirds and left the other two in place. I think that's grossly unfair to school districts, and I, I don't know the answer to that, but I'm willing to jump in there again and look at, look at what we're doing to our schools and, and uh, the QEO. I'm hearing some people say we need to expand that to all governments. Hmm. The problem I have with that is that it leaves the exorbitant costs of health care, the runaway costs of health care, in place and penalizes the worker as opposed to, I'd rather, well, we're going to tweak education. We know that's going to come up. But I'd rather really work on that health care piece so that we can get that under control as opposed to the salaries. Even businesses would like to have that under control. So okay. that's my position on it. A couple of other real quick things before we have to wrap up. Um, how do you feel about a statewide smoking ban? Obviously, we just went round and round with that here, but some of the viewers have, have questioned, um, you know, what candidates feel or how they feel about a statewide smoking ban. Is that something that Luann Bird would be supportive of? Well, I'm hearing that it will level the playing field, and I'm actually being asked to, to, to to propose that kind of a legislator, le legislation in the state. I'm open to that. I'm open to that. It's, it's working well in some communities. It's not working well in Oshkosh. I'm sympathetic to the businesses, and mm -hmm. I like to go to those businesses that right now are hurting. I don't want to yeah, see some them are go dying. out of business. Some I know are dying. that. I know that. But you're balancing that with the need for some employee someday who might get lung cancer. You know, you got the public good side of things. So I'm open to listening to that. Proposal okay. and taking it depends again how you craft it, and there's a lot of details behind that. Sure, there is also um, talk, and there has been in the past, about um, a, a seatbelt law, a mandatory seatbelt law. Well, we have a mandatory seatbelt law, I'm not phrasing that right, where the officers can actually stop you simply because you're not wearing your seatbelt. And this was a question from a viewer also. How do you feel about? that if that were to become a law or do you think it should be a secondary only offense? Off the top of my head it seems like it's a secondary off offense at this point. That it should remain I'd that have way. to look again though at the yeah. statistics out there. If mm. you show me statistics that we could save a lot of lives and that the police actually have time for something like that then of course I'll look at that. Okay. But if you if you there's no good data on that, well, like when they changed the laws for the drive, the 16-year-old driving and one person in a car, clearly that was going to save lives. Great idea. Okay. okay. We've got about 30 seconds left. Why don't you look into camera three and tell folks why they should vote for you in September? Well, I've got a lot of experience coming into this race. I've been a voice for positive change in my community, in my neighborhood. In, in my you know, family issues, we've done a, I've done a good job of, of being able to take on tough challenges in the past. So what I'm hearing out there is people trust me and they believe that I will be a positive voice for change in Madison in the future. Right. So that's what I want and I want to work on the issues that are important, health care, education, campaign finance reform, what we can do to bring jobs to our state. All right, terrific. Thank you very much. And Thanks we've been doing the show. Welcome. We've been putting up your website address, your phone Thank number, you. your email address. Thank you. So I appreciate folks, that. So uh, definitely have a way of getting in contact with you. Uh, this uh, September will be the primary, and then uh, whoever wins the primary will go against Carol Owens or Dick Spanbauer, whoever wins, wins the Republican primary. Um, thank you for joining us. As always, we appreciate it. For Melanie Bleckel, I'm Cheryl Hens. Take good care, and we'll see you next time. Until then, keep your eye on us. We've got our eye on Oshkosh.